Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. We're joined today in this video by members of the staff of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. Our membership and admin coordinator, Kelly Ross, is hosting the call and coordinating technology for us this morning. Jean Helms and Chelsea Krafka are here with readings. Several of us are present in the chat room running beside this YouTube video on Sunday morning. We also have lay pastoral care folks on call this morning, and so if you need someone to talk to as this call goes on, as this service goes on, reach out and we'll get you in contact with one of them. We're still practicing this new way of being together. And while it's a time of anxiety, it is also a time of possibility. We have learned a lot in two months. We have become a church that went online out of emergency and now we are figuring out how to do it week to week. A whole lot has changed. But the thing that stays the same is the vision of this church. That we aspire to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration, and we are about the work of transforming ourselves and our world. That is a big, big vision. And we know that creating a loving community begins with welcome. So whether this is your first time hearing me say this or your 500th time hearing me say this, if you have stumbled onto this YouTube video by accident, or if you are a longtime member, if you come here hopeful or heartbroken, whatever your age, gender, skin color, whomever you love, you are welcome with us. Share the warmth and light of this place. Our ask is simple in this time. Do not keep this church a hidden gem. Invite people to come. If you're on social media, share these videos on Facebook, share them on Instagram, share them on Twitter. If it's on either of the latter two, I probably won't respond, but if it's on Facebook, I will like your post. We have this service on Sunday morning, Zoom Vespers on Thursday night, interviews and daily updates on YouTube, stories for our children, connection groups for members, talent shows, music. Come be a part of this community with us. We enter into worship on this Sunday morning in all our varied, varied spaces. Maybe where you are, it isn't Sunday morning. Maybe it's Tuesday at midnight. But wherever you are, whenever this is, take a moment and make yourself comfortable. Breathe. Begin to connect with that which is the ground of your being. And let us begin. Our chalice lighting words this morning are a reading by Sean Neil Barron, who writes a history of church, including yours. One day, your church was born. Maybe it was a gathering of saints called together for the common worship of a wrathful God, ceaselessly praying between bouts of decrying the evil of Christmas or of dancing. This is true of some Unitarian churches in the Northeast. Or maybe a few brave souls answered a notice in the newspaper, curiosity piqued by the announcement of a religion where free thinking and tolerance were bedrocked. No matter how it happened, your church was born a gathering of people, humble, caring, anxious, and quirky, all at the same time, who covenanted to be with one another on the journey of life, death, and everything in between. And so it began. A faithful few, beautifully imperfect, called to that central task, that human task of connecting, loving, and serving. It was just a baby, and yet it was thrust deep into the human condition, tasked to hold minds and souls, bodies and hearts along the roller derby of disease and birth, infighting and joy, and Christmas pageants. Sometimes all of those at the same time. They gathered to hear the world broken open for insightful sermons, rejuvenating music, 
and a community whose fierce dedication to each other's well-being rivaled a mama bear's for her cubs. But it wasn't always like that, of course. There were trying times, and I don't just mean Phyllis or Jack, those stubborn but lovely souls who inhabit the netherworld of committee meetings. No, I mean the trying times. When the church almost split in half over the war or integration, or when the mill left the town vacant, or when the minister crossed that line and people couldn't speak about it for decades. But somehow you were still here, still on the town common, still the church that everyone recognizes, still the ones that show up every time you were called on, still using the communion silver, unless you voted to sell it. New people came and they changed things, small things, big things, things that nobody noticed as it happened until suddenly it was hard to recognize anything anymore. That was a hard moment, a tearful moment. And other things changed too. The proclamations about God, once heard loud from the pulpit, softened. Wrathful became loving. Distant became intimate. Mandatory became optional. After the war, the nursery and RE classrooms were overflowing. Every baby dedicated reminded the church of the incredible beauty of life and gift this community. All huddled around would bestow the child. The history of your church is more than a story of the determination of love to break forth than it is about tie-dye or chalices, sermon discussions or social justice meetings. The history of the church is the history of the human enterprise, evolving in its sights and sound, yet revolving always around its core. The history of your church is a gift of potential and momentum of baggage and personality. The history of your church is the launch pad from which you spring into action or disarray. Each day, your church is born. Our opening hymn is a special one for me. Our choir is singing today, and we, uh, for the music, decided to use that as an excuse to tour virtual choirs around the country. So our opening hymn is sung by the choir of First Unitarian Church of Baltimore, my home congregation, singing one of my favorite hymns, Shkeldi Aldas.
In about an hour from when this is premiering, we hold our annual spring congregational meeting. And then in the life of our church, the spring meeting is a time to reflect on the year that has passed, to celebrate successes, to elect new folks into leadership, and to talk about our priorities for the coming year. We're gathering at 11 to do that. And I will try to at least get my annual report up on YouTube for posterity. But a sermon is not an annual report. Worship is not an annual meeting. A sermon is part of a conversation between a preacher and a congregation that tries to point at the meaning that underlies the charts and numbers in an annual report. The job of a preacher is, as Reverend Cheryl Walker put it to me once, our chance each week to tell people they can make the world a better place. And when things don't improve that week, we repeat ourselves. We are living in extraordinary times. Two months ago, I walked up to the pulpit at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln without a clear sense of what was about to happen. It's one of the few times in my career where I've walked into our church building in the morning unsure of how to possibly repeat myself. Unsure in the moment if a better world is possible. Two months ago, we closed our building in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and it was an excruciating decision. It, it still is. And we did it without knowing how we were going to manage it. We did it as an act of faith, knowing that the medical system needed us to buy time and knowing as leaders of the church that we did not want to put our folks in harm's way. We took that step as an act of faith. And what has been remarkable in the last months is this. More than ever, that hymn is right. Where there is faith, there is love. We closed the building not knowing how the congregation would respond. Would people be angry? Would they be frightened? Would they just drift away, unable to connect with each other and the community in this new way? And what we've found instead is an outpouring of care. Over the last two months, you've called each other, you have sewn masks, you've baked cookies, you've delivered soup, asked each other, how is it with your soul? We have laughed and cried together. You have been a community in the midst of upheaval, not in spite of it. Every single Sunday, I, I get up, either in the pulpit or in my living room, and say that we have a big vision in this community, that the Unitarian Church of Lincoln is a loving community first. I am so happy to serve that vision and to know the truth of it. Two months ago, as we were closing the building, on that Sunday morning, I, I grabbed hold of the community and its history. Even though we didn't know what was going to happen, we knew what our history contains. This is the 150th anniversary, the 150th year of universalism in the state of Nebraska, which means that even on days when we don't know what to say, 
We can remember that this community has endured through countless moments from crop failures to the Cuban Missile Crisis, maybe not knowing what to say, but knowing that we are a loving community, knowing that we are hungry for a religion of hope and love. Where there is faith, there is love. Where there is love, there is peace. Where there is peace, there is blessing. Where there is blessing, there is God. And where there is God, there is no need. The God we know in this place is not a God up on high looking down at creation and deciding when and where and how to intervene. This loving community's faith is tangible. Faith is expressed through acts of love. Love brings peace. Peace brings blessing. And there, that's where God is. Right here, with us. In the soup we deliver, in the telephone lines, when we say, how are you hanging in there? And that, that is a God we know by many names. That Which Holds All by Nancy Schaefer. Because she wanted everyone to feel included in her prayer, she said right at the beginning several names for the holy. Spirit, she said, Holy One, Mystery, God. But then thinking these weren't enough ways of addressing that which cannot be fully addressed, she added particularities saying, spirit of life, spirit of love, ancient holy one, mystery we will not ever fully know, gracious God, and also spirit of this earth, God of Sarah, Gaia, thou, and then tongue loosened, she fell to naming superlatives as well. Most creative one, greatest source, closest hope. Even though superlatives for the sacred seemed to her probably redundant. But then she couldn't stop. One who made the stars, she said. Although she knew technically a number of those present didn't believe the stars had been made by anyone or thing, but just luckily happened. One who is an entire ocean of compassion, she said, and no one laughed. That which has been present since before the beginning, she said. And the room was silent. Then, although she hadn't imagined it this way, others began to offer names. Peace said one. One my mother knew, said another. Ancestor, said a third. Wind, rain, breath, said one near the dark. <laughs> Refuge, that which holds all. A child said water. Someone said Quan Yin, then womb. Witness, great kindness, great eagle, eternal stillness. And then there wasn't any need to say the things she'd thought would be important to say. And everyone sat hushed until someone said, Amen. Each week we gather together in a diversity of beliefs, knowing the divine by many names, by no name. We gather in community because we love each other, because we want the best for each other.
And so each week when we gather, we, we take a moment in our worship service to share the moments of our lives that are most important. So as this next song plays from our own choir, take a moment, pull up the chat box on YouTube and type in your name or a person that you are holding in particular care this week. This next reading by Karen Herring is from her book, With or Without Candlelight, edited by Victoria Safford. The first time I saw the phrase oriented times three, I was working in a hospital as the chaplain. The phrase was used frequently in patient charts and at first I thought it might be shorthand for an extremely oriented patient, like being oriented to the third power or being uber oriented. I imagined a patient who was aware on many levels, sharp, quick, responsive, cognizant of what's going on inside her and around her. A nurse then explained to me that the phrase refers to being oriented to person, place, and time, a determination commonly made by asking patients, what is your name? Do you know where you are? Do you know what day it is? And I began to wonder if we might ask similar questions to determine if a person is oriented spiritually. What would it mean to be spiritually oriented times three? What questions might we ask to determine that? What is your name? Do you know who you are? Do you know whose you are? Or do you know where you are? What is your place in the world, in your life, in your relationships? Or what day is it today? What time is it in your life? What is it time for? Or what are you living for today, tomorrow, yesterday? These are not unrelated to other questions I ask all the time in hospital rooms, in the pulpit on Sunday, in long nights when I'm alone. 
What do I believe? Where do I belong? What does it all mean? Certainly I know the questions better than the answers, but I also know this. We, we all have spiritual compasses inside us that help us to arrive at our own answers. Sometimes we can read our compasses more easily than others, but we all have something that spins towards north, an inner tug toward the holy. And in those times, when our compass is impossible to find or to read, or when it points in a direction we don't want it to go, or we can turn to one another or to maps that help us get oriented. We can turn to constellations that guide us to where we're headed. Perhaps this is what it means to be spiritually oriented times three, oriented to self, oriented to others, and oriented to the holy. Perhaps this is what we're doing here together, reading our compasses, finding our way in a universe of shining stars, and making new maps to help one another. So what is our compass? What would it mean if in the, in the margins of our church's history, maybe the membership book that goes back 150 years, there was a little notation in 2020 saying Unitarian Church of Lincoln oriented X3. Can we answer what is our name? Do we know where we are? What is this moment? We are a loving community. That's where we start. That's our calling card. That's our first identity. We are the people who show up. We are what one of my colleagues has called us, the love people. We are a loving community and we are a people of vision. And because of that, we know, because of our vision, we know that it doesn't end with love. Our community is grounded in love and welcome, and, and that is a hell of a good start. And I just said that on a video. Um, ad limbing is fun. But anyway, that's not where we end. We don't end in love. We begin there, but that's not the end. This spring, I, I started a doctorate of ministry program. That's more the kind of thing that I'll talk about in my annual report. But for now, here's what I've taken away from this last week. My professor, Lovett Weems, believes that the most important two words in the life of any church are so that. So that connects the thing we do to the reason that we do it. We come to church on Sunday so that we might be transformed. So that is the, the means to the end, the task to the mission and vision of the place. Thich Nhat Hanh puts it this way, a finger pointing at the moon is not the moon. The finger is needed to know where to look for the moon. But if you mistake the finger for the moon itself, you will never know the real moon. We point so that we might see the moon. A loving community is an end in itself, absolutely. But it is not the only end. It is a means to something greater. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration so that, so that, we can transform ourselves and our world. We are about the work of transformation. And we are about the work of transformation because Unitarian heritage aside, we know that none of us are the best possible versions of ourselves and the world we live in is absolutely not the best possible world. 
the means of transformation is love. Love will transform the world. It does every single day. I know that because it's what's transformed my life over and over again. I was transformed by love sometime between Stacy and my third and fourth date. I was transformed by love the day my daughter was born. I was transformed by love when my life fell apart and a Unitarian church in downtown Baltimore caught me and helped me piece myself back together. We are a loving community so that we can be about the work of transformation. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln saves lives. I am convinced of that. But we don't actually stop there so that we are, we are transformed so that we can be about the work of transforming the world because we live in a broken world. And our faith is not waiting on a Messiah to come fix it. Right now in Lincoln, there are about 700 COVID-19 cases. And while people of color make up 15% of this city's population, they make up 70% of positive COVID-19 tests. That doesn't happen by accident. And the systematic issues that led to that outcome also don't get fixed by accident. We are about the work of transformation and it is sorely needed now more than ever. Outside of COVID-19, this has been one of the hottest decades on record. Tr climate change is happening. It's affecting our community. And that didn't just happen. And it's not going to be improved by accident. We are about the work of transformation and it is sorely needed. Last year, a study of college kids found that 60%, 60%, of trans college students screened positive for clinically significant depression, compared with 28% of cis students. That doesn't just happen. That's not an accident, and it's not going to fix itself. We are about the work of transformation, and it has never been needed more than it is right now. So here we are. It's May. Our building has been closed since March. And looking forward, we can probably say with Karen Herring that we know the questions better than we know the answers. But we do have a compass. We know that we are a people of love. Whatever our name for the divine is, even if that name is love itself, we know that the divine is present when our love transforms ourselves and the world. And we know that the world is sorely in need of transformation, whether or not we are in our building. Transformation is always possible. And so we gather for this congregational meeting, marking the end of something. In my mind, at least, this Sunday marks the end of the beginning of this time of pandemic and social distancing. We have got a long ways to go. And so this also marks a beginning. In the last two months, we've figured out the mechanics of how to be together. We have loved each other through it. And you have kept this community strong. Now, what comes next? For what? So that, what is the transformation that we are called to? Let's be about it, and amen. A couple of announcements as we move to a close to our time together. We have a congregation meeting at 11 a.m. You will have time to refresh your beverage after the end of this recording and then head over to the Zoom link that was in the daily e-blast over the last two weeks. If you need the Zoom link mailed to you, please indicate that in the chat room right now and someone will send it to you as soon as possible. During this last song, 
please think about giving a small contribution to our offering plate, which goes to support the operations of this church. We encourage you to try your hand at text giving. Simply text UC Lincoln space and the amount you wish to give to the number 73256. This is also in the chat room right now as an example. Our final song is another virtual choir, this time from several churches in Brooklyn, including the Unitarian Church in Brooklyn that I attended when we lived in New York. This is How Can I Keep From Singing?
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of love, or the fire of commitment. These we carry with us until we are together again. Be at peace, beloveds, and amen. We'll see you in a couple minutes in the congregational meeting.